All right, folks, Mark was going to kick this one off, but we learned a very interesting detail about his life immediately before starting. Look at him. He's already mad. I'm not mad. I I love it when Mark gets flustered. Mark doesn't have a PayPal account. Jim. It's 2019. You know PayPal's made out of technology. I'm... (laughs) I'm anti. I'm practically, you know, writing every manifestos time, in the books over in the woods over here. Every so. time you've ordered something online, you, you, we've determined he actually has to pull out his card and, you know, boop 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 boop, type in all the stuff. Jim, and I'll, I'll be honest. How many times you must get your credit card information stolen? All the I'm time. aware that PayPal is a thing. <laughs> I couldn't really tell you what it does. He's on his fourth identity. <laughs> it's incredible. I, I got a PayPal account. When I'm I in the protection was, program anyway. Yeah. They just give you one. I think I have to be honest too. I've only had one for like. Oh, seven years maybe. So yeah. It's, oh, you know, so it's just so it's just new. been in the last couple of years. Yeah. Just the last guy. Okay. I, Dude, I, I thought I, I thought I was gonna really get some solid support from <laughs> yeah. across the yeah, table. Yeah. I'm, I'm Not sorry. The case. Yeah. Oh uh, well. Mark. We did figure out how to start your truck with the auto start yesterday though. Two days ago. You've had it all this time. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is sad, Mark. It's. I just. I don't is... take the time. God, I'm getting hot. No, it's all right. Is, yeah, no, that's that's all we. Uh, I don't take the time to investigate. That's all right. Pretty easy going. Yeah, easy going guy. All right, Mark. Now you may enter into your beginning that you had planned. Well, now that's all off kilter too. <laughs> all right. If you don't have a PayPal account, which apparently I'm the only one, so I guess I'll get one. I suggest that I get one. Apparently, somebody They're pretty out, handy. You know that somebody out there. It's going to be like, oh, yeah, it's good. He doesn't have that. It's Russians or something. <laughs> yeah. So maybe you're, true. Yeah. you're set up best. Yeah, to maybe your identities apocalypse. are getting stolen. That's very possible. All right, guys. Uh, covered some pretty serious ground there. Um, got a good one here. It's mid January. And uh, depending on when you listen to this, it may not be mid January, but it's all very relevant information. We've got. Uh, Jimmy here, as per usual, embarrassing me. Uh, we've got Eric, frequent guest, slash almost always here. Yep. And we've got uh, <laughs> Jeff Sturgis, who specializes in habitat management of uh, private parcels. Now, you might say, well, maybe I don't own a piece of land to hunt whitetail bucks or does. But uh, you don't necessarily have to. If you've got access to a property, permission on a property, or like we talked about, if you own a property, uh, you should probably, or there's things that you can do to optimize it uh, to make it um, a darn great place to hunt. So that's why we've got Jeff here to expound on this subject. And now is probably when a person should be thinking about that. Uh, You might say, hey, it's the off season. But is it ever really the off-season? So that is the question, Jeff. So, um, number one, thanks for coming out. Yeah, thanks for having me. And number two, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself in more detail than I provided because that wasn't very much. And uh, let's talk uh, whitetails and hunting strategies and whitetail habitat. Well, sure. And I think, uh, you know, I talked to you guys before, too, uh, really getting into the habitat management, to me, had a lot to do with hunting. So I had that hunting basis first and then bought land, tried to improve it. I found there wasn't a lot of information out there, and that was in the mid-90s. And, and so going forward, since that time, I, I worked on private land since the 90s a lot, and I tried to relate it back to that hunting. If I'm putting a food plot here, a food source, if I'm making a bedding area, a water hole, mock scrape, anything, how does it relate to not only how it blends in with the entire habitat picture on that site, but how does it blend into how ca- I can hunt that parcel and you find that sometimes some of those improvements actually take from your ability to hunt that parcel your ability to build a herd because they're located in the wrong spot you're constantly spooking deer you make this property that's so attractive that it's too attractive and you invite a lot of deer to the neighborhood and then you just repel them off Hmm. so i started with that background and then going forward so i started my company in 2005 since that time i've designed and worked on right around 800 parcels in 25 states I work on about 70 a year. Wow. And, and then from that, I've written five books, and I have a big YouTube channel and then a, a large website. So it's all based on, you know, I get to scout property for a living, whitetail property, design it, and then go back and hunt myself. I hunt a lot, you know, all fall, you know, all fall. But then every time I write about it, speak about it, create a video, 
then it's like taking notes for what I learned out in the field. So mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a constant love. I can't imagine people say, what are you going to do when you retire? I can't imagine doing anything else but still look at whitetail properties, still scout whitetail properties, and still learn about whitetails. I have to admit, I am very one-sided when it comes to wildlife. I have pheasant hunt in the past, grouse, rabbit hunt. I used to have rabbit dogs. But really, I love to whitetail hunt. So I've never been big game hunting other than bear hunting in Canada. So that's about it. Pretty boring, whitetail. <laughs> and how it relates to habitat and hunting. And like I said, pretty pretty narrow focus, but that's a love and a passion of mine. Yeah, I think I think whitetails maybe get too much of a of a quote boring rap at times. We we went out to Nebraska, we hunted a whitetail. That was a heck of a hunt. I mean, whitetail will give you a run for your money. It is not it is not something that you can just go out and just kind of ho hum go and just shoot one. Right. <laughs> yeah, especially that, the older that doesn't the, happen. Right. They're pretty darn crafty. I yeah. mean, Midwest, out west, they're smart animals. For they, as much as you see them it doing dumb things at times, like, you know, oh, just, sure. oh, I'm just going to stand in the road and wait for a car to hit me. <laughs> yeah. That same deer will then also be extraordinarily crafty at getting away from you. Oh, yeah. Can we, real quick, I, before we jump in, because this is new stuff to me personally, habitat management and creating or designing these properties and things like that. What What is it, I guess, what... What is it that we're doing, and why are we doing it? Why would I, I guess I can? Sometimes you look at a place and you're like, I bet there's a lot of deer there. Sometimes you look at other places and you think, probably not. I can't put my finger on what it is about things that make great deer habitat and things that don't. But sometimes it's a little intuitive. But what what's going on there with that? With this, I guess is that. To, to bring it way back for somebody who doesn't even have much of experience this, never even thought of doing it? Yeah, that's a great question and a great uh, topic, too, because um, even, I think it was this morning, I put out a YouTube video, and it was all about the four components or the four ingredients of what makes the best deer bedding habitat. And, and you think about some of the large pine areas. You know, pine is a, is a base bedding structure. You, you know, that's good to have conifer, but then there's no daytime browse. Uh, switchgrass, great standing grass, great cover, but no food. Hardwood regeneration, great daytime browse, but then you don't have that thermal cover of grass and conifer. And then finally, shrubs. Shrubs are a real thick, brushy component for deer and whitetails, and they're great for rabbits, small game. But those alone, a lot of times there's a lower food value than hardwood regeneration, you know, an aspen clear cut or, you know, just uh, uh, following a timber harvest. But then again, it still doesn't have that cover of conifer grasses. So, you have those four pieces, and if you can get three out of four to happen in one spot, typically you have a lot of whitetails. Huh. So when you look up north, uh, northern Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan, upstate New York, and you get into some big pine areas and swamp areas, very limited. You think, boy, there's a monster buck way back in there two miles in, but there's really no day, maybe daytime browse. Maybe it doesn't have that thermal cover. So it really boils back to if you have diversity, and I'd say, like, where you find rabbits, pheasants, grouse, quail— there's usually good whitetail habitat. Whitetail needs diversity. They need edge cover. And something goes back to, and, and just end with this real quick, with the, uh, you look at a parcel, let's say it's 40 acres, and you look at the amount of edge you have around that 40 acres, that's 440 yards by 440 yards, 1320 by 1320, so you add that up. Now look at all the habitat changes inside that 40. If you have highland to lowland, wetland to hardwoods, the pasture, the food plot edge, the clear cuts, the bedding areas, travel corridor, and you have all these edges taking place. You add up all that edge in the inside. You see great whitetail parcels exceed that outside dimension um, by 10 times, 15 times. So there's so much more edge on the interior of that 40, as opposed to a straight 40 of conifer, straight 40 of hardwood. You just don't have the deer or the wildlife on those big monoculture areas so the more edge the better hmm. so when you're driving down the road you can see where deers are going to deer are going to be killed you know that's where the deer crossing signs are they're adjacent to good diversity cover upland cover diversity of habitat lowland mixed with high, high and, we're, and we're in southwest wisconsin here and man the the habitat around here is beautiful because you have those elevation changes which dictates a change in habitat and and, a, and just really a wildlife abundance for for not only whitetails but all wildlife yeah, I mean, you bring up a good point. You know, we're talking about a specific region, or at least just for the second right now, you're talking about southwest Wisconsin. But I imagine all those things 
you know, change depending on where you're at. Like you might be in a region that doesn't have the topography that we have here, but maybe it has other things that we don't have here. So right. how, I guess how does, how does that come into play then? Oh, a huge amount because now I was fortunate because I grew up in lower Michigan, flatland, agland, and then I traveled up north to hunt in the UP. And we lived in the UP for 14 years. I hunted in Pennsylvania, big hardwoods for a long time. And what you found is when you're up in the UP swamps, when you're the hardwoods of Pennsylvania, when you're lower Michigan flatland, I've hunted out here now for 17 years. There's a big difference for how the deer relate to all that different habitat. They relate to each other the same. They relate to hunters the same. They obviously don't like hunters or <laughs> people, humans. <laughs> but, um, but at the same time, there's still the same balances. And so my first book that came out in 2012, I, I wrote about an intro conclusion of a buck hunt. And it was, you know, the buck's coming, basically remote area. That's how I walked in. Talked about a lot of the concepts in the book in the intro. Conclusion I talked about in, the, you know, shooting that buck and harvesting it and how all the concepts in the book fit. And then I revealed that was a public land hunt in the UP of Michigan. And so people are buying it to design the private lands. And so it doesn't matter if you actually have land, if you can improve land, you're still looking for these same features of movement and how you can access and hunt on public land if you go out there. So I like to have a lot of information and strategy that it doesn't only apply to private land. It really applies to public land too. And it's just really how deer relate to, to uh, the balance and the habitat. And there's bigger balance in the, in the big wilderness areas, big wood areas. Deer will travel further from their bedding areas to their food every single afternoon, but they still feed five times in a 24 hour period. They still need browse during the day and they still hit their favorite food source in the afternoon. It doesn't matter if it's a UP in Michigan and a buck's traveling three quarters of a mile or if it's in Northern Ohio and it's flat and there's only 10 acres per section, and he's traveling 150 yards from yeah. bedding to feeding. I mean, and that's what's so intriguing to me is like, you know, talk anytime you get to talk to someone like you, Jeff, that really understands habitat, you can, you, you there's a few people out there, you being one of them, that can look at a giant piece of property on a map and narrow it down to the select place that they want to hunt. And that's all I love dovetails doing back to habitat. So could you yeah. kind of speak to how you do that? Yeah, that's one of my favorite things. So I went back and I hunted uh, public land in Michigan this year, public land in Pennsylvania. Um, I hunted public land in Ohio for the last seven years, but I mean, you know, a total of 50 years and all this stuff. And some of that can seem kind of daunting. Uh, Pennsylvania land is three by 10 miles area hunt, and that's two miles reservoir and two miles road. And it's change of uh, 700, 800 foot change in elevation in there. You take out all the, the open flat tops of hardwood. And then you take all the people access areas out where they're just walking in because they can't drive in anywhere in that three by 10. You take out the campgrounds. So mostly hardwoods. And then all of a sudden you start to find these hemlock bottoms. So where you have the hemlock bottoms, if you look on an aerial photo, they might represent 5% of the entire area. So right away I'm Xing out almost every piece of habitat that doesn't involve that hemlock edge because that's the first portion of diversity. And then you're finding the flat areas and the benches up top, the good oak stands up top. And by the time you look at those and you connect them to the hemlock features, you're looking for habitat change. It doesn't matter if I'm in the UP of Michigan and I'm looking at giant stands of hardwoods, giant marshes. You're looking for where it all connects. You're looking for clear cuts versus old mature stands of timber, high elevations where they meet low elevation, wet where it meets dry. And if you can find all those changes together in one spot, then that's where you find deer. Again, going back to their creatures of edge. So a lot of times if you're looking at a giant chunk of land, you're looking for the highest diversity of habitat within that area. You're Xing out all the people access points and parking areas. And you're Xing out within a half hour walk of those areas, maybe in 45 minute walk. And what you're left with is a very small per percentage. So if you're looking at 10,000 acres, you can typically narrow that down to a few hundred acres or less really quick. Huh. So it makes for very efficient scouting efforts. And you're trying to make sense of it all ahead of time, knowing that they want edge, knowing that these are away from people, knowing that these are certain funnels based on topography or habitat that you can hunt. And then you're just going in there with a laser focus, only focusing on those areas. Don't get distracted by anything else. You know, you see the, the old guy along the road and he's saying, you know, I'm, they're over in this area, we see mature bucks all the time. You know, it's great information. Maybe you go back to that. But if you're out there scouting for a weekend, you need to take a day and a half, go right to those spots. You'll find four or five that you really like. And then when you come back, you're, you know, you're putting a stand location and bow hunting and 
just a few acres out of 10,000 and you have a lot of focus. And then when I'm out there, I'm looking for not only, and a lot of times you're scouting in the summer, but let's say you're, you're doing a quick scout in the fall. I'm looking for a combination of current sign and a his, historical sign. Historical sign is worth more than current sign. So I'm looking for old rubs that have been there that you can tell for many years. And so it shows that not just one buck was there at one time or even for two or three years. It shows that mature bucks were late to this area over and over again for every year. And if that's matching up with why you went in there to scout in the first place, then you have, you have a good winner and you've narrowed it down pretty good. So you really can, between looking at it from the air, you can narrow it down to just a few hundred acres. And then when you're on the ground, putting boots on the ground, looking at sign, you can narrow it down to a few acres pretty quick. Well, that explains why we didn't see any deer when we pretty much looked around near the parking lot that one time. Yeah. On, on uh, absolutely, <laughs> where the heck we were <laughs> interesting. We should have yep. left the parking lot. Yeah, we should have gone. <laughs> Darn further. it! Next time. Um, so, w- as far as like talking about some of the private land stuff, and you know, you mentioned sort of like designing a habitat that's good for hu- both hunting and or, or both deer and hunting. Where does somebody who's got a and actually this might dovetail almost in two different ways because Mark you briefly alluded to this because I was going to say where does somebody who has a piece of private start but then also kind of before we jump into that I wanted to allude to the fact that you don't have to be an owner of multiple multiple acres in order to be interested in this yeah right because you could be somebody who goes around and finds somebody that you get you you lease yeah. Or you get permission on and you if let's say you get permission on a piece of land, maybe that maybe that person wants to do something with their their land, their yeah. plot, and you can help them with that. So kind of what we're getting at is don't assume that if you don't own land right now that this doesn't apply to you. Yeah. Oh well, yeah. You, well yeah, and then to the all the points that Jeff just made, a deer's needs are a deer's needs, regardless right. if you know, it lives on public or private land. Yeah. So maybe a lot of these um you know, uh, features that maybe you're trying to enhance on a private parcel, they're the same things that a deer likes on a on a public parcel. Yeah. Oh man, so that's, yeah, such you're a great you're point. looking for you're essentially if you if you are hunting public, if you look for all these same things and you find, like you said, that that hub of uh, converging edges and habitats and you know food source browse bedding, uh, if you find that area of diversity. Mm-hmm. You know, you're 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 Absolutely. in the chips, and if you're able to, you know, if you have a, a private piece that you can manipulate, yeah, and yeah. make that even more attractive, you might be in the chips. And I've got a question that I'm gonna I'm gonna maybe tease this question out, <laughs> but I wrote down earlier: make your piece of land too attractive? Question mark? Yeah. Question yes. mark? Question mark? Yeah. So anyway, yeah. we're not gonna get there yet. Jim, that's a, I just that's a great exp- one to circle back to. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to talk about that. That's and, very very important, actually. And a yeah, lot of what you're important. doing is on small properties, isn't that right? Like, yes. Yeah. What's your hunting situation like? So, like, size? I'm, for me, hunting personally, the uh, I have three parcels that I lease. You know, going back to lease or ownership. Uh, just real quick, the great thing about hunting public land is you're looking for these same concepts and the movements of bedding to food, even some water holes mixed in, even some scrapes, and 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 you're just finding them. It's mm-hmm. just boot time. It's yeah. free. Private land, you have to put in a lot of work to do the same thing, and you're trying to compact that same movement, those same features on that private land. Private land parcels I hunt are right around 40 acres. Uh, one has eight acres of ones, woods, one has 30 acres, and the other one about 45, and they're all pieces that are 50 on down. My average client even, uh, about 50% of my clients are 60 acres or less. The average is hmm. about 110, 120 because I go to a few 400, 500. I've been up to 4,000. I've been down to eight acres. Wow. So, wow. Okay. Pretty broad range, but half of them are in that 40, 60, 50 yeah. acre range, 70, yeah. somewhere around there. They're pretty, pretty small. And, you know, it kind of goes back to, you know, not a lot of people can afford the 200, 300, 400 acre pieces. Right. And, but what I found, it's pretty interesting. A lot of people that own 200 acres, 400 acres, they're putting the same resources and energy into that piece that someone might put into 50. So because those efforts are scattered on the 200, they're not contiguous, they're broken up, they're not matching each other, they're more random, then they're actually getting less of a return on that 200-acre parcel than that same person doing the same work on a 50-acre parcel. What if that makes Mm. more sense? You can actually pack things in so that 50-acre person has the 
ability to be that daylight influencer, that one that's holding those those deer and attracting the focus compared to that 200-acre piece that's more broken up and not really complementing each other, at least the yeah. habitat improvements. I bet when you I bet when you scout around public land quite often too, you uh, you discover new things that maybe you weren't aware of. It's almost like oh, uh, yeah. it's almost like test driving a car, right? Yep. I kind of have this idea that maybe this would be a good a good thing for deer habitat, but you know I'm going to go mm-hmm. to this public piece that maybe has a similar aspect to it scout it and see if you know there's historical sign around it and things oh, like definitely. that yeah and you see the same patterns repeat themselves but it's kind of like if you're building houses and you're building a house that you know every plan is different every location is different you have different elevation changes different needs of the homeowner and you know you love building houses and, and then at when you built 20 houses that's you know one level when you build 100 that's another then 500 and you be in, if you keep an open eye to it and you don't get bored, which I don't, I have a real passion for this stuff, then whether you're on public land or private, you can learn something on every single private, and that goes back, you know, every single piece, and that goes back to that's why I can't ever imagine re- retiring. This yeah. is, yeah. That, I love whitetails and I have a passion for that. And now my wife, Diane, she goes to a few more with me just hanging out at the hotel or I think she's down in the lobby right now or wherever. Yep. But anyways, <laughs> right. with some coffee and relaxing. So, but anyways, uh, fire, yeah, it's nice that down. she can... Uh, you know, spend a little bit more time on it too. But so, where do these where do these landowners or people again who are leasing or or have permission and things like that? Where do they start? Oh. What do they What do they you know? They look out in their back uh, area or their their piece of land, and I mean, some of these chunks, even even really like even a forty acre, which is nothing to sneeze at, but compared to some of the ones you've you've worked on, is kind of in that mid range. But that is just there's a lot. That could be going on in there. Where right. do you where do you start? How do you know? Well, you can you can imagine when I go to a parcel, I have to have a pretty set system in my head, or it'd be just so confusing when you go at. And I've had yeah. people that told me that, you know, they've tried to do what I do on a property, and there's a lot of people that do this successfully, but they've tried and they just were confused. And so what I try to do is I I don't know if I'm the only one in the country, but I might. But I offer a plan at the end of the night. I actually draw it up with them. You know, often at a bar or restaurant, we're sitting there, and it takes me an hour, hour and 15 minutes to draw up. So that, but when I leave, they have something. And so for me, in my head, it has to fit logically. And the first thing it always goes back to is if you look at deer, they feed five times in a 24 hour period. That means twice at night, twice during their bedding hours, and then once in the afternoon, about an hour before dark. I believe that sets the clock every day, but they're like rhythmic pattern feeders. They're, they're like babies. So they have to feed there. But to me, the foundation of all movement every day is food. You know, of course, they have to go to their bedding areas, but that bedding to food source movement in the afternoon sets the table. So the first thing I'm looking at is food. And it's the same with them on public land. That's why I'm looking for diversity or I'm looking for clear cuts because that, that's that food source. On private land, though, food plots are an incredibly powerful tool. For example, if you have uh, ag land around you, the ag land's always changing, it's always rotating. Um, and then I don't want those deer an hour before dark every day out on my neighbors. I want my property to be the bottom of the funnel of daylight movement every single day. So I want the deer, they could be even betting on my neighbors, but I don't want them feeding on my neighbors. I want them betting on my neighbors. I want them hitting my food source right before dark, and then after dark they leave. And so that sets the whole pattern. So if you have a square 40, you put that food source in the middle. I want to draw a deer from, to that middle every single day. The problem is, on a 40, you put five, five acres of food in the middle. You only have 155 yards of depth all the way around it before you hit your border. So you don't have a lot of depth to actually hold does, young bucks, and then mature bucks. So I want to, look, I want to locate that food on one side of the 40 or the other, maybe two sides, so that by the time I go all the way back to that corner, I have 330 yards of depth where I can actually hold an assemblage of does. They like to bed closer to the food than young bucks and then maybe even some older bucks. And it might be that they're coming in from one neighbor's parcel to the other and they need that 400 yards of depth. It might be in the UP of Michigan, you know that they're out in public land and they're a mile and a quarter from those bait piles that they're going to in November, you know, Mm -hmm. out in the hardwoods on the public land. So for me, it starts with the foundation of food. Make sure that you have food where you're not walking through you're not spooking deer off every day, and the deer don't see you, hear you, smell you. A lot of people think that bedding areas are an important sanctuary. Um, you know, you have to have the bedding areas in sanctuary, but to me, 
because of that foundation of food and that food source movement every day, it's almost that your food sources have to be more of a sanctuary than your bedding areas themselves. Hmm. You have to let that movement repeat. You put in diversity of food, you keep it the same, it lowers the stress on your parcel, you keep that movement. Then once you have that framework in place where you can actually get on and off your property without spooking deer, now you can assemble your stands. You have stands that are backside bedding for morning area stands waiting for deer to come back to you, bucks especially. Then you have evening stands that are closer to food and cruising stands in between. So then once you have that foundation set of food, the rest of the pieces fall into place. And then you can have that stand assemblage where it makes sense of I'm hunting here in the morning, here in the evening. And then you have that parcel. You can do that on 30 acres. You can do it on 500. You know, it's it's interesting, you know, hearing you say that because before the podcast, Eric and I were chatting. We're like, what do you think Jeff's number one thing is going to be? And we actually both bet on betting we thought that the betting was going to be the number one thing <laughs> yep. so hearing you say that it's that's the food is kind of um it interesting and i guess tying into that so what would be and i guess maybe we're getting into the ta- the tactics a little bit but so how do you make that food source a sanctuary and feel like it's a safe place um when it's kind of the foundation of the system and then what things are you doing on these places to be able to get in and out safely where you aren't bumping these deer off? Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of different ways. And so it really depends on the lay of the land. You know, out here in southwest Wisconsin where we have these hills, and, and that extends in Illinois and Iowa and Minnesota, um, all the way up and down the Mississippi. But we have a lot of ridge systems and valleys that you can hide food in. And so it might be that you can still peek in over this ridge or this ridge and get a shot. Um, but you can use a lay of the land to hide food. And then other ways, uh, switchgrass. Switchgrass and solid switchgrass is something you can frost seed on exposed soil. Around here, it gets to between uh, six foot the second year and maybe seven or eight the third year. So a really solid 30 uh, foot wide strip can hide a lot behind it. Can I ask a dumb question? What is sure. switchgrass? It's, uh, it's a grass, it's a native grass okay. that um, will grow usually about 40 inches to four feet the first year. That seed is almost like a sesame seed, a dark sesame seed. Hmm. It's a small seed. Um, What's nice about it is it's the only grass, at least around here, that will actually hold up to some snow. So you can, can, like right now, we had that wet snow, end of December, somewhere around there. Well, my switchgrass is matted down, and then as soon as it melted, the switchgrass is back up to six feet tall. It oh, no springs kidding, back really? up where the other grasses, blue, big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass, a lot of native grasses just crushed down. Hmm. So right now I still have rabbits and pheasants around because they can actually use it. And it's not solid switchgrass. I have solid switchgrass as far as pockets or lines, but I don't have, you know, then you have goldenrod ragweed, and then you have box elder growing up in briars, and so you have that mix where wildlife can go in between they still have that food source they still have that edge and uh and you can go from there huh and you're kind of using that then i mean it sounds like almost as like a a visual barrier yeah switchgrass egyptian wheat can grow 12 to 15 feet 13 feet tall that's great for an annual uh perennials or switchgrass a perennial so it stays up a long time i've had clients that have built a quarter mile berm um one that was three quarter mile where it's a 40 acre and they built a berm around the roads so the road system went around berm 12 feet high and then they put a blind right into the berm and they actually have a parking spot and can access that's up in near wausau area up in that Whoa, area but holy cow. <laughs> they actually shot 184 inch with their muzzle loader i think three years ago out of that that spot but holy um crap. but the deer that's ne- elaborate the yeah deer, the deer <laughs> never know that they're being watched and that's key with the food plots if you're ever going to and i just I was telling Eric that I have a video coming out in the next week, and it was the five reasons you shouldn't plant a food plot. And I talk about, you know, really, bottom line, it all boils back down to if you're ever going to spook a deer from that food plot, if you're ever going to allow them to establish a pattern on you, then you shouldn't plant the food plot. Because if you have that food plot, it can be a huge attraction. And if you're putting a diversity of blend in there that lasts the entire season, then you're inviting every deer from the neighborhood they come into that food plot, and then you spook every deer from the neighborhood. Where if you didn't have that food plot in the first place, you wouldn't spook those, spook those deer. It'd be more random. Yeah. You're saying you wouldn't, so spooking them in this case isn't like necessarily like you jumped out at them when they were, you know, or something like that. Like <laughs> yeah. spooking them is just changing their It's their It's usual more pattern, like, or? let's say I have a lot of food plots that I go to because I get to see, you know, a lot of the stuff, and that's why I said, it, you know, you learn every property you go to, and that I've made my mistakes too, but... It's, I go to clients where they have to literally walk through their best food plot every time they go to all 27 stands on their 300-acre oh, parcel. Yeah. 
um, or they go across the ridgeline. And every deer in the plot can see them going into their land that way because it's their only access. Yep. Um, so there's a lot of times you can cut the food plot in half. You can add switchgrass. You can add yeah. Egyptian weed. Or you can add a berm in, in extreme cases to make sure that those deer, it's not a sanctuary if the deer can ever see you, hear you, or smell you. Okay. So as long as you can stand in that food plot and even a blind, if you can't get into that blind without spooking every deer on the food plot or letting them know you're there, then... The blind has to be moved. The food pot has to be shrunk down. Yeah. And so, and then I have food pots, um, a few of them that most of them that I can't actually sit on and hunt unless it's with a gun from a distance. And I, and I do enjoy shooting them, you know, with a gun at 225 yards or Jake shot one with a muzzle loader, I think 185 yards two years ago. Mm. And so I do like that. I like hunting with guns, muzzle loaders and the bows. And, but if I, there's food pots I've never hunted on with a bow because I know I can't get in or out without spooking them. Interesting. It's how, just not worth it. How long does it take for a food plot or something like that to be established as this, quote, sanctuary? Because at some point you had to be there to kind of set it up, right? So that, just the act That's of being a great question. there is kind of... Yeah. So I look at it like um, September, Labor Day. Um, and especially that would be more like say Indiana or Ohio where the bow openers on October 1st and Labor Day would be a good drop dead. And you might have to go there and replant something or add some rye middle of September. I think those are okay. And so I'm really looking at a lot of plantings late summer and I encourage a lot of my clients to, and it's not that all are that way, but I look at a food plot pyramid where the bottom is green. You have to have that foundation of green and then corn and then beans. And so really you're looking at green planted first, and that would be around August 1st. So once you put that in October, uh, August 1st, a lot of those deer around here, they're out on alfalfa fields, soybeans, and around the country in ag areas. And so a lot, you know, the does are more homebodies. They stick around, but they can take a lot of pressure. Those mature bucks, though, they want high overstory and shade during the summertime, and then they want beans or hay. And all, they get that last cutting of hay in September, the beans turn brown, the leaves drop, there's hunters in the woods. And so I find those bucks, there's about a mile difference from their summer home range to their fall. Mm. And so when you're planting in August and you're out there working, even finishing up some tree stands, it really doesn't take long. Those deer, imagine that food plot being pretty appreciable by the end of August. They're starting to feed on it. Middle of September, end of September. Now you get into early October and they've been on it for two months. And so they themselves have established a pattern of repetition that every time they go to this, they're not getting spooked. And I go to a lot of landowners where we're out there in February. It's the first time they've seen deer beds, pellets, rubs, scrapes on their land. There's all this activity. Well, it's the first time they've let the property go for at least three or four weeks, maybe five weeks, where they haven't been on it to push deer. And so since October 1st or since September 15th in Wisconsin, you know, that third Saturday. So it doesn't take long to get it established back. You know, it might take four or five weeks. And that's why it's so important to hide it because then you can still hunt and go into your stand assemblage and not spook the deer that are making that trek from bedding to feeding every day, you really set them up and give them the illusion that this is spook-free, that there's no hunting pressure. And when you allow that pattern to repeat itself from opening day, from middle of August, end of September, whatever it is, when it gets into November and those deer have not been pressured and they're on your food, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. And that's a potential that a lot of the landowners that I visit haven't seen because most people are driving their ATVs under the plots or they're hunt over hunting their plots, over pressuring the plots, their plots set them up. And those plots have just as much risk as they do reward as far as how it can hurt you or help you. Kind yeah. of getting back to, I think, what was your question again? Oh, the, just uh, making a spot too attractive, that one? Or? Yeah, the too attractive. Yeah. It kind of goes back into that. It's you have that property that's so attractive that you can't get on and off the property without spooking deer every time you yeah. go on and off the property. Oh, yeah. And that, that's the best neighbor to have if you're doing it the other way right. because deer quickly recognize, even across the fence, that this property is safe, low risk, and this property is high risk and unsafe. Yeah. And mature bucks, there's not a lot of mature buck parcels out there. Very low percentage. I'd say 5 to 10% or less of all whitetail parcels. A lot of big doe properties. Those are easy. Just put a bunch of great habitats and plant them, and the, and the does will come. Would you say it's possible to have, like, that stereotypical, you know, classic mature buck property on something that's, like, 15 acres, like, super small? Is that? Think of it this way. You know, and especially now you get in closer to Madison, where I grew up, lower Michigan, Oakland County, Troy, Pontiac, Oak, you know, pretty big suburban urban areas. Clarkston, you know, extends out to uh, urban areas. And, and you get north of Wisconsin or Madison, south, doesn't matter. 
you get into those suburban areas that might have a 10 acre park or a neighborhood set aside that's 15 acres. And there's some areas where they don't allow hunting and a big buck, I remember one in lower Michigan that was shot and the guy tried to explain that he shot it up in the thumb area. Well, this was in Clarkston, like 60, 70, 80 miles away. And it was a buck that everyone saw on the way to the work on the back of a 10 acre parcel in a, in a subdivision setting. And it would stand out by I-75 around exit 93 and, you know, guy couldn't hide. He had to admit that he finally yeah. snuck in there and shot it. And so it just shows that these little metro parks that are 20 acres, 10 acres, neighborhood set-asides, it's amazing the deer that grow up in these areas. They don't have food plots, water holes, mock scrapes, travel corridors, bedding areas, hinge cuts. <laughs> they just have no hunting pressure. Yeah. And, that's, yeah. and that's the key. And so they go out in the neighborhoods. They feed every night on gardens, ornamental shrubs. So how do you hunt that super small property then? Like if that's what you're working with is a little 10-acre spot and you want to hunt, how do you how do you balance that? I'm assuming there's some kind of trade-off there. There really Climb is. Climb a tree and live in it for a while. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Become one with it. There's, there's a few different ways. One of the things like in, in a lot of urban areas, the hunt is not the hardest. It's getting permission is the hardest yeah. to hunt. Mm. Imagine these bucks that are used to the kid playing basketball next door. They're used to... Um, human noise, human scent. And so when you just walk into the woods, five acres, and sit down, they're used to all this noise. They're used to scent. You just, but getting permission is hard. Now, if you actually own 10 acres and you're trying to manipulate the habitat and create a good hunt, I can think of the eight-acre parcel in Lower Michigan where he had a golf course on one side and the neighborhood on the south and an ag field on his, on his uh, west side. So he had this little eight-acre eight strip. On the west side of his parcel, he had about five acres of hardwood, cut it all down for bedding, most of it, mazes and a lot of brush in there. And then on the um, east and south side, it was kind of an L, and we had him wrap a little clover trail through that, a lot of autumn olive apple trees. And he literally would hunt about 30 feet off the road in a pop-up blind, looking at the, looking down south on that little line that went through with clover and under the apples and scrapes. And then the, and then it went side to side in front of him. He was on the corner and went right into that hardwood uh, bedding area. He just sat on his wife, he and his wife shot some really nice, a uh, couple four-year-old bucks over two years. She shot her first buck, a three-year-old. And it was just those deer use that, at, use that as a funnel between the golf course and the neighborhood. He mm-hmm. was right in between. If you're up north and you're doing that, I've seen some great 10-acre small parcels next to public land. And so they're putting a three or four-acre food plot and they're managing the attraction of that. So they're not spooking deer off that. But then because of where it's positioned and people can't be, get behind their land to get on public land, they're drawing that deer herd in from the public land that's very remote all the way to that food source. And then they're actually killing the bucks and shooting them out on the public land or on their borders, rarely even at the food plot because they, you can't destroy the movement of that, that uh, food plot. So there's different huh. ways to use little parcels depending on where you're at. And when you're up north, food is so much more important because there's – um, green food and you have all hardwoods and conifers and then you might be in an ag area golf course subdivision setting where you're just using a thin strip of food to actually create a scrape trail for bucks so that when they dump when they do come through the property cruising during during the rut that they're following those trails and you're using just a little bit of food you know might might be a quarter acre total on a 10 acre parcel we're up north you might want to use three acres or four yeah you i guess maybe this is a Maybe this is a segue, maybe it's not, but you kind of got into stuff that is neighboring land, golf course, egg field, public land, whatever it might be. I'd imagine that when you start designing the way that a property is going to be laid out, you also have to take into consideration into consideration the neighboring properties. Oh, definitely. You know, because I can think of some properties where you go out to and you're walking along the edge and the neighbor's got a stand or a blind right on that edge, right Mm -hmm. near your property. So that's probably where you got to, okay, you know, they're probably going to be going out there and they might be spooking deer where, you know, you can control what you do, but you can't always control what your neighbors do right next to your property. So you probably have to move in a little bit or avoid that area. Yeah. How does that, how does that go into play? Especially for a guy like yourself, when you come into a situation, you, aren't as familiar with the neighbor situation, you know, is that guy always kind of pushing the boundaries of the edges, you know, or is that guy pretty hands off? Yeah. Are they not hunting at all? Yeah. So part of that, when we meet in the morning, we usually meet at a breakfast spot 
And, you know, initially, and this is something Diane, she does all the scheduling, and so she'll talk to me, me for breakfast or meet at their cabin or something. But the whole point is to sit down. And so I'm trying to get to know them, their goals, their resources, their history with the property, the history with the neighbor's property. So the neighbors are really important. And what I find what's really interesting is you know, everyone, you know, hunters are a really good group of people, and I have great clients. And, you know, it's hardly ever you have someone, you know, they're good, really good people. I don't even know if I've had someone say, I just want to shoot big bucks and that's it. And, you know, here they own this, this uh, several thousand dollar or several hundred thousand or a million dollar property. They're always concerned about their neighbors. So the neighbor has a stand on this border. And, yeah, they might even be mad at them for, for that. And so what they'll do is they'll move, a, they'll move their access in 100 yards or 50 yards on their own land because that neighbor they know is hunting there. And here on a 40-acre parcel, they just gave up 20% of their chunk, land yeah. to the neighbor because of that. So for one, where, where neighbors have access, and I encourage a lot of exterior access only, or anyways, but if the neighbor's already accessing on that line, then what a great opportunity for you to use that same line. And then you're not doubling up the access. You know, you're already using it. And so typically if you're using that access on your east side and that neighbor's hunting on your east side, you're only using it with west winds. He's probably going to use it with east winds, any winds, doesn't really matter. Yeah. So it's kind of cool if you do have east winds and you're hunting on the west side of your property, then he's hunting on the east side. He's pushing those deer over to your side. And so on, that's how you can manage at least the hunting pressure on small parcels. At the same time, you have to consider that we're, we're food plots. So food plots, let's say um, I've had a property where it's a school or a factory um, or big open playground fields, uh, ball fields, uh, soccer fields. I can think of one of those across the railroad track. Safe place to bring deer every single night to food because they're coming to your property and whether they go back into your property or they continue out in the neighborhood, golf course, schoolyard, whatever it is, it's a safe place to bring deer every single night for that food source. On the opposite, if you have hunting pressure there, the worst thing you could do is put food. Yeah. Because if you have big food there, it doesn't matter if half those deer live on your land, they're going to live on their land too. And now you create a situation where you're placing a certain percentage of deer during the daylight on their land and it gives you, it offers you less of control. And, it, you know, ultimately it's, you know, it's not your deer, it's not our deer, but at the same time you're trying to control your resources and be efficient with your own land so that, you can actually maximize your potential. And imagine, I've, I've had a couple landowners where don't talk to my neighbors, I don't want you to help them at all. But imagine you have two parcels that are still doing the same, and to me that's worth three. You really have a, a situation where they're trying to maximize their potential of herd, same here, their buck egg structure there. And now you have two little segments. It's no different than if you had 300 acres and you have four areas that complement each other. Mm -hmm but they all can be hunted differently with different access and stand locations, different departure. So you can actually really, truly maximize your potential. Wow. So there's a lot of things, you know, and your neighbor might have water. And this is the thing too, you have dry bedding on your property and there's water on your neighbor's 50 yards away across the border. Well, real important if those deer are traveling the opposite direction to food every night and that's what you want is just to offer a little bit of water because once those deer get out of their beds and they go to your neighbor's 50 yards away, they're very efficient creatures. They're less likely to actually just come back. So if they make that trek towards dark, they eat your neighbor's water because they want that, it's, it, you know, dry, whatever it is, or they're rutting, then they're probably not going to come back during daylight. And so you just gave that to your neighbors no matter how much you do the, the other way. So you want to be really conscious of that with water and your mm -hmm. positioning of water, making sure that, and, and so then if that water is only 50 yards back there and your neighbors are probably not going to make that route because they, they want to hit your afternoon food source every single day. So a lot of different things. That I, it's a big puzzle, and I love that. And yeah, I was yeah. going to say, what a crazy strategy game. I was it's gonna, fun. <laughs> yeah, it is, actually. <laughs> I want to talk so. a little bit more about the importance of water, but I also yeah. wanted to ask if you've ever had landowners um, work together, you know, collectively or collaboratively to be like, okay, my land maybe has these features, yeah. your land has these features, how can we... Um, work together so we all have a better experience instead of like not instead of but like you know no i know exactly i'm, tr I'm trying to suck everything on my place and i know yeah, you have that stand yeah. there and you know has, yeah. has that ever happened definitely and so what will i i basically manage properties by the size of acreage and complexity of that property so for example if it's 160 acres and very very hilly and extremely hilly um and it's going to take 10 12 hours to walk it then that might be a long day or two day client but I work within that range, and a lot of times it might be this 40 acres and this is 60. Together it's 100. They can pool the resources together. 
And what they've offered or asked me to do is kind of balance out the improvement so that they have a somewhat, you know, of an equal amount of stand locations on both sides, but one person might have more food, one more bedding. And then they actually look at it as landowners and as neighbors as, you know, we have 17 stands. There's three that are good for southeast winds this morning in a morning hunt. We draw straws and we go hunt. And so what I do when I go to the properties, I look at it as one 100-acre parcel or one 80-acre parcel instead of 240s. And I design the properties if I was just looking at it. And I, and I do have that a lot. And I love to see that because then you know they're working together. And even if, you know, for some reason things go sour in the, in the future, they still can take those same concepts and put them back to just each, just each their own land. Mm-hmm. But I've yet to go back to a parcel like that. I've had a lot that were combined. And, yeah. um, and they were just good neighbors. And, you know, they wanted a strategy that incorporated both their lands. And, uh, and I think that's, a, you know pretty pretty noble and at the same time it's a lot of fun i think more fun i think it's smart yeah you know if you're able to do it yeah yeah Very yeah cool. you share trail cameras and that's what you find with small parcels and good age structure in the area like around here you find that when you have and i'm not saying there's mature bucks everywhere here but there's a lot of four and five year olds oh yeah and they get slotted in more and so when you have neighbors making these improvements even across a 100-acre parcel, you might find with a, with a solid structure and a solid trail cam strategy that you have nine trail cameras around that entire area. You have one, two, three, a mature bucket a picture there, six, seven, there's another one. You start to learn if that, that deer's living on the property or a mile away because he's coming in the middle of the night. But you can actually see that those bucks really slot in in the areas around here so that the east side of an 80, there might be a couple mature bucks that relate the middle, another one, and then on the west side. And it's not true like they're there every day, but they do, you carry the highest consistency of daylight focus for that entire area. And so when you're putting those properties together, and especially a long rectangle or long sprawling piece, then to me you have more of a net that you can cast out and capture that mature buck movement every single night or during the daylight when they're cruising. Yeah. You briefly mentioned uh, trail cams. That must be a pretty good way of keeping an eye on how things are going in certain sp- places that maybe you set up without obviously stepping foot and spooking deer. Oh, it's and just stuff awesome. Like that, right? And so during the during the hunting season, um, hunters always ask me, you know, when should you check your cards? And I say check them when you hunt. And so a lot of my trail cameras are set up at the stand locations or near. I hang the trail cameras high. I use infrared, uh, low glow, or blackout cameras so that you aren't looking at them. I use a tree that's higher than the, that's wider than the diameter or the, the width of the camera, so it's hidden, maybe even a side branch or a side trunk. So there's a lot of ways to make sure that you're keeping the focus off the trail camera, putting them at a stand location, so that when I'm using an exterior access or an interior that's non-invasive, I might travel by two or three other cameras on the property, so I'm bringing cards and changing them at that time. It's important when you have that foundation of movement, that food source movement, the bedding area movement, the travel quarters, everything's set, and imagine that a buck comes in at night from a distant land a mile away. He turns left or right on your movements. He goes to a bedding area. He goes between bedding areas. He goes to a food source. There's lots of pellets, urine scent on those, those uh, lines of movement, uh, travel corridors. So pretty cool that you have this property. You have the trail cam set, uh, system set up. Now when that buck comes into the northeast corner and he's coming in randomly middle of the night, two or three times in September, two or three times in early October, you can look to the northeast, northeast, and you see another patch of cover that you think he's probably living at a mile away. Now you know he's not going to come back during the pre-rut, end of October, because he already has does where he's at. He already feel, feels comfortable. There's first that first one or two does that he breeds up until November 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, the 3rd, whatever it is, he's going to find really easy. And so he is telling you, though, you're part of my wheelhouse. You're part of my nighttime movement. You're part of my territory. I will be back during the daylight, during the middle of the rut. But he's not going to come over when it's 80 degrees and 35 mile an hour winds. He's going to come over on a good weather day, and he's going to come in on that. And so you look at a 10-day forecast from the 5th through the 15th around here, and you know you have one of those non-core boxes staying somewhere else. You have about 10 days to, that you can potentially shoot them and hunt them. And then you look and you think, man, those six of those days are really bad weather days. And so you really narrow it down. It seems like a needle in a haystack. You only have five pictures of them over the last two years. But he's told you you're a part of his movement. And he's told you, I'm only going to be back during the middle of the rut. 
And you go in there and all of a sudden you, you walk right in your lap. And, and that's how I've killed probably about half of my bucks because I have these small parcels and the deer don't live on them all the time. Mm-hmm. So timing is key. But then there's those other bucks. I call them core bucks. They're in and around your land during shooting hours. You don't wait till the rut to, to go in on those. The rut is the time, especially peak rut, when they have half that time, they may be on someone else's land. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. someone else's Norca. So when that trail cam system, you can identify which box are which, which core, non-core. It's not exact, but you can put them in those. Then that tells you, I'm going to wait on these tree stands till the middle of the rot. I'm going to hunt these stands in the pre-rot. So it tells you when you go in to what stands for which buck. And then it also tells you if you know those deer over in a non-core area on your neighbors. We have neighbors we drive by and see if their gates are open. Because if their gates are open on the weekend hunting, then we know that they're back at their cabin and there's certain bucks that we have a chance on that'll come over from their land a mile and a quarter away because they're out being invasive and hunting them. And then, so we would only hunt those oh. bucks on a Saturday or Sunday Jeez. when the gate's open. And if the gate's not open, we won't go hunt those bucks. So <laughs> you keep track of your neighbors, especially in these little patchwork areas, and they can tell you a lot. And it's amazing when you look back where, yeah, you know, I saw that nice 12 point with a drop tine and he came in on these weekends and sure enough, those are the neighbor, those are the weekends your neighbors are there. And, yeah. and so you'd, you know, you're, you're hunting your neighbors a little bit as much as you are the mature box when it comes down to those small parcels. Now, Jeff, I don't really know if you can get into your past too much, but were you ever a CIA operative? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I cannot comment on that. Why, <laughs> <laughs> Why is MC Ryan looking at him saying, don't yeah. say anything? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, we're on the same level. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, for, uh, oh, boy. for yeah, MC Ryan, we have a feeling could be a CIA operative. Active. Yeah, he's just... You Look, he's know. not saying anything. <laughs> yeah. He just, yeah. You may have just sealed your fate, Jim. Good, yep. uh, yeah. Oh, I shouldn't have said it. <laughs> well, folks, if you don't hear me on the next one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, but uh, can I rewind you two real quick? I feel like maybe the answer is obvious, but maybe it's not, and I just think it's interesting. When you're talking about where you put your trail cam and having that be super... Uh, incognito, if you will, picking a tree trunk that's wider than the actual profile of the of the camera. I actually didn't realize that there were these blackout cameras. You don't want the attention to be on the camera. Is that because you don't want to break the deer away from their natural movement, you know, by just kind of a, hey, what's that, squirrel, you know, kind of right. thing? Or, or is there any other reasons? There's There are a lot of, you know, if, when I talk to clients and readers, viewers, there's so many mature bucks that people get one picture of on a trail camera, yeah. and that's it. And we've seen a huge aversion to even the infrared. So the red bulbs are yep. glowing. I can remember we were trying to catch a trespasser, so we're putting them in a spot 14 <laughs> feet up, you know, doing the CIA thing. Yep. But um, <laughs> so we're we're trying to catch his trespasser, and he had uh, taken a couple. I say he, but you know, whatever. But anyways, he was. Uh, I taken a couple. Uh, trail cameras, damaged one, uh, you know, threw it in the water hole, that kind of thing. And we, we've never had problems like that. And so we put a camera 14 feet up in the tree, and we get pictures at night of does and fawns and bucks looking up at the infrared glow. Oh, wow. No kidding. And then some of them during the day would walk and look up and do that same thing. And so we've had other cameras huh. where, um, say, not an infrared glow, and it's on a smaller diameter tree. Every deer that walks by during the daylight looks at it, stares at it. Some of the mature bucks, you can tell they don't like it. And then you get one picture of a mature buck, yeah. and they don't come back. And then that same camera at night, it's on that small diameter tree. None of the deer look at it. So you know they don't smell it. They don't hear it. They can't see it because there's no red bulbs. But you can tell that it's spooking them during the day, and they don't like it. And so to me, it's very important. Like I wouldn't put those cameras at my stand location if I didn't think. And so I actually... I've created a couple of videos like this and articles too where I look at a rate that if your deer per hundred are staring at that camera when they're doing their natural thing, walking by, working a scrape, getting a water hole, if they're looking at that camera more than five times out of a hundred, then you probably need to change the location, do something different because rest assured that mature buck that yeah. comes through. And I've even looked at this year, we looked at, we broke it down to I think uh, 13 out of 16, we rarely if ever had a deer look at the camera and so there's really no need for you You can tell sometimes they're just looking past it they're looking to the side but if they're coming in staring at moving their head a little bit and backing up a little bit we have one that they did that on um then that's a really bad thing and so then you're not going to and it's no different than if you're taking a deer census in august and september and you're throwing a corn pile out and you're putting a a uh a camera on a rod that's just you know 
cameras out there and it's just kind of hanging there over the then you're not going to get a percentage of those mature animals that would come into that, that would otherwise come into that uh, corn pile, let alone in Michigan, corn piles are kind of bad. I mean, a lot of people use bait, and they, the mature bucks have an aversion to the bait piles during the daylight, too. Yeah. Not to mean, so yeah. you really have to be very... Uh, I was going to say, well, that comes back to, I mean, almost on like a micro scale of what you're talking about of, you know, keeping your food a sanctuary. Yeah. yeah. Right. People are hunting. If you had a bait pile... Right. I, I guess I haven't hunted over bait for deer but i mean you are putting pressure on that right. food source yeah. right I, you know i got a question for, you know going off that like you know a lot of these properties that you're hunting are smaller properties and it's all you know pressure based and whatnot what happens if you know you you educate a deer like will you go back to that same spot or do you pivot then and start you know you're limited uh 30 40 acres <clears throat> are you then you know, will you not return to that stand because well, maybe that's a what deer? What do you mean when you yeah, that's good. deer? Wait. Like by spooking it or let's say oh, you miss okay. a shot. Reading, or, writing. Writing, yeah. <laughs> Teaching it English, <laughs> math. Well, little buddy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're yeah. going to go over geometry today. <laughs> anyway. they, uh, what I find is there's about three to four weeks of forgiveness. And yeah. it goes back to that. I'm out with clients in February, and they all their tracks, and they're telling me they're not seeing a deer in November, December. It just keeps a diminishing return every day. They're seeing fewer and fewer deer to the point where they're sitting two weeks a lot, and they're not seeing deer. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times it boils back to the, how they're overpressuring their land, mm-hmm. and that's another thing that trail cameras can tell you. You know, you, you have these patterns repeating all the time. You hit it for the weekend. The patterns go away. You got to learn to be very critical because most hunters, myself included, the last person you want to blame is yourself. I mean, ask my wife, you know, Diane downstairs. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's easy to blame everyone else. But the that's that's a really tough one, you know, to analyze those cameras. So you know, getting back the the uh, the cameras and trail cameras and spooking deer is just so critical, and you can tell so much by the deer. But um, yeah, you can't spook them. Yeah, anything you do, you can't spook them. Whether it's on a food plot, yeah, water hole. And again, it goes back to all those levels of attraction. They have the ability to educate deer even more. Right? Someone just asked me this morning, when, is there a bad time to put out a mock scrape? There's a really bad time, and that's hunting season. Because imagine you're touching the licking branch and you're putting it right. out. The deer go smell that. They have an aversion to it. You have a camera. You see the does backing up and going away. And then it takes two or three weeks to settle down. Well, if you just put that out October 20th, you just blew your rut in yeah. that spot. And it has a ripple effect. It's not just that spot by 10 yards. It's that spot by 100, 150 yards that they avoid. But, again, if it goes back to those weeks of forgiveness, I had a, a buck I shot, uh, it was, uh, let's say it was 09 or something, and he came by, hit it on the side with a, um expandable. I thought I got it kind of rode down the side. It was a steep angle. He jumped. I shot him again. Long story short, with the hits and everything, not going into too much detail, but uh, 10 days later, I got another chance at him. You know, we kicked him up five hours later. He was chasing a doe. It was like he, the wounds were totally healed. I had a stripe on his side about 10 inches long. It was just like cutting him. He comes by, it was about 10 or 11 days, and he's coming towards the tree stand, and he stops about 30 yards away, and he starts to go uphill. And so something imprinted in his head. He came around the corner. He's staring down. He's not looking up at me. He doesn't know what happened. He just knew there was risk and risk assessment, and but still close enough to where I shot him and, and got him. And, and he was he was really on his toes, and he was about 30 yards away, and he was just going to go around me. He just didn't know what was there, but he had some kind of negative memory. Again, I feel like three or four weeks passes by, but who has three or four weeks during the season? Yeah. You spook him October 15th or October 10th. Now, if you can, you can take some chances in Wisconsin mid-September third week of September, fourth week, go into a bedding area in the morning and see if he comes back because there's enough weeks of forgiveness before that rut. Gotcha. But, hmm. Yeah. So One thing that hit me is we were walking through the woods and we saw a ton of trees of those cherry burls. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I got to thinking, like, does a deer stop and look at every cherry burl? You know, like, what's the difference between one of those and a trail cam? It's a valid question. To a deer. I don't know. <laughs> I think the cool thing is, is that it's... You know, it doesn't, they don't associate with that human scent and that yeah, square it's human scent. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's, you know, square and shiny almost. It's, right. it's so, it's, and that goes back to even habitat improvements. I like staggered, rounded, um, straight lines are, are people. Straight, yeah. straight trails. I, going back to that border where you, your neighbor's hunting on the border, if you put just an, a straight line right down your, your uh, property border, to me, deer associate that with. Um, people and so they're less likely to you know it's great they go across that line they get on your property they feel safe 
less likely to use it, walk down it because this is a people trail. I think people realize that with shooting lanes all the time. I can't tell you, I've gone to clients where they move the shooting lane three times because the bucks just keep going around the end of the shooting lane. <laughs> so they have that shooting lane, they move it back another 20 yards to capture that movement, the bucks move back 20 yards. Yeah. So, <laughs> But straight, again, square, it's just unnatural. And imagine a box plane. Yeah, you know, yeah. Right yeah. out the middle of a food box. Plane. You know, the local... Emphasis on... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Huge. The, 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 shape. the local deer get used to it, but imagine that buck that's living somewhere else during the summer, all of a sudden he comes on your property the first time in daylight on October 27th. He sees this giant box out there. I think he runs. And mm-hmm. does he ha- do you have enough time to recapture him? You know, to two or three week period, you know, does he'll get used to it eventually. Yeah. But that covers a rut, gun season. You know, is he going to get used to it, and is he going to be alive still? You know, right, right. I mean, do you think after, like, a blind like that is established, at some point it just becomes, you know, part of the terrain, though, like I uh, think a the, fixture? I think to the local deer herd. Yeah. So the, the does and fawns that are always around there, the young bucks, but for that mature buck that has a dual range where he's living, a lot of times he's living midwinter to late winter and then spring, summer, in early fall, let's say not even early fall, but into September, then for him to just, you know, I, you're looking at that hunting season herd, whether around just end of September, end of October, through January, end of December, I just don't think they have enough time from year to year. Mm-hmm. It's just like they don't remember a negative maybe four or five weeks later that something happened in that spot. I don't think they say, hey, you know what? I saw that blind last year, and I think it was okay. Yeah. And gotcha. I think that they're that you have to redo it all over again. Well, those does and fawns that are around there because they're more home bodies. They, they stick. They stick close to home. Yeah. You can push them around a little bit as far as them getting uh, used to hunter scent and intrusion. Mm-hmm. I think they get used to it quite a bit. So yeah, you, all, I think all creatures get used to stuff, you know, because it's like when you live around Wisconsin and you go out to Utah or whatever and you see mountains and you're like, what in the heck is that? Thing? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And somebody out there is like, oh yeah, that. Yeah. I buy it every day. Yeah. 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 But. But yeah, if you don't have time, then you know if you're leaving and coming back, and you know that's uh, especially with those uh, mature right. bucks. They're yeah. immature bucks are different. You know, you look at does and fawns. I love the mature bucks because they they feel like you feel like they have individual personalities. So they're they're individual creatures. They think on an independent level. Does are herd creatures. They remind me of the wildebeest that jump off into the river. Crocodile eats you know one out of a hundred whatever. Mature buck is that creature that would sit there, assess the risk level, and just, you know, they're just saying there's a risk, and something goes off in their head, and they go around that to a couple islands, a sandbar, and then rejoin the herd. That, to me, is a mature buck. They're independent thinkers, and they live or die by that, and if they make it through their yearling buck and two-and-a-half-year-old buck years, then eventually they become pretty wise and pretty smart to where they're very dependable and patternable, but at the same time, they're very, they have a huge aversion to hunting pressure. Any mm-hmm. kind of sense, sound sight, they're, they're a lot more reactive to me. Yeah. You know, to what I've seen. So when somebody's, when somebody's doing some of these things and these alterations speak to their, their properties, there's got to be a fair amount of sweat equity into that. How long does, how long does that, does it take some, I, I'm sure it depends on the property, of course, because every property is going to be different. Some might already be close to being set up. Some might be further away. Right. What does that what does that look like though for? That's a great question. You know what? I, what I a lot faster than you think. So imagine that if someone especially has all the pieces. Let's say they have their property ninety percent improved. We're altering twenty or thirty percent of that. We're altering how they access their stands. We're establishing core areas that include their food plots. We're making sure they're not spooking deer when they get on and off the property. We're making sure they have morning stands, evening stands. We make an assemblage of that. I even number them sometimes. We'll go through. Number one is northwest, north, northeast, morning stand only. I'd wait till the end of October, early November. We'll go through on each stand like that. Once they have that plan, so it's not as much putting the habitat in, the lowest hole in the bucket of all habitat management and herd management on small parcels is hunting pressure and how you hunt the parcel. So once you manage that and you take the pressure out of the hunt, then the pieces fall into place really quickly because very few people are doing that to where they're not pressuring or not overpressuring their food plots, their land, their, their trail cameras, everything. So now if someone has to build it, chainsaw right now is your best friend. And, but you're not chainsawing the entire woods on a 40-acre parcel. You make four, five, six acres of chainsawing. 
and you're putting that lumber down the ground, you're, it's like adding a Christmas tree at the bottom of the lake that can fill with fish pretty quick. And mm. so you're putting that wood down the tops and logs and debris. But then over here on access, um, I, I went to a property that's 40 acres up north, um, north of Eau Claire in December. And I did a video on that. And, and what I talked about is they had all their stands on the interior of the property, over 20 stands. And then they had a lot of open ground with native grasses that are all flat during hunting season out here to the roads and property line. So really the core area, they had none. Every time they went on the property, they went through the middle. Oh, yeah. But for him, taking all that cover out, the switchgrass can go four, 40 inches to four feet already. They already have the native grasses. They already have shrubs on the interior. Taking that hunting pressure out, moving those stands towards the outside, creating access on the outside. Now he can designate 27 out of 40 acres to all deer all the time in the middle. And he's just rearranging what he already has. He's using almost 90% of everything he has and their hunting should improve drastically and dramatically this year because they have older bucks in the neighborhood, but they're not coming on, on the property until after dark. And that's what I see. You make the property too attractive. Everyone wants to buy that property. They put in all these resources and time and energy, and they have a diminishing return every single year because the first year is great, those food plots. That's always you. The first year is always the best, but then the second year not as good and on down the line to where pretty soon you're making a nocturnal par parcel for mature bucks in year three or four. And by the time you get into eight, nine, ten, not only is it a nocturnal parcel for mature buck, but it's fewer bucks because those bucks don't even go on the property. They, yeah. they just, it's too high of a risk. They know it, it gets established. You can flip that around in one year. Switchgrass, great cover component because in one year can grow close to five feet in southern Wisconsin. And by the end of year two or three, you can get it up to the seven, eight foot range and it's extremely thick. So it's not that you're using switchgrass for ultimate bedding. You're using switchgrass to hide the bedding within early successional growth, uh, pockets of shrubs that you planted. It doesn't matter if those shrubs are a foot high. They're food. They're daytime browse. Briars coming in, box elder, um, early successional growth of maple or hardwoods that are coming in. So all those shrub tips, goldenrod, ragweed, it's all food. So if you use a switchgrass to surround those areas, and maybe that switchgrass totals 50% of the field, but it hides and surrounds everything, then an uh, overgrown field, you could put switchgrass in, and with one year, you already start to have cover. And if there's just a little elevation change in there, you can hide everything. And within two years, it's done. Now, it doesn't mean you don't plant some conifers along the road or some conifers in the field, um, some shrubs or trees here and there. But you don't have to wait for 10 years to those, for those to actually fill in. Just put the grass in. So that's when I look at a property. I want it, And I go to a lot of properties, property owners. And you can see these, these uh, property owners are, uh, I would say, on average, not always, but you, know, you have some in the 50s, 60s. And I have them say... You know, a 70-year-old landowner up north by Eau Claire, he's saying, I don't want to wait 10 years <laughs> for this to come in. So, yeah, right. And I'm looking at, like, you can make changes right now. I mm -hmm. know he can, and I know he's going to do it. And whether I have a turnkey partner that he cuts property, uh, Ross Fernandez, and he puts water holes in, and he plants switchgrass. So there's people like that out there, but then a lot of my landowners have sons or hunting partners or themselves that are capable to do this, yeah. and they can do it right now. And so what I'll do is say, you need to put this cover in. You need to change your stand locations and access. You need to put this, these food plots in. They're already planting food plots in the first place. They might just trim them down or move them. And um, they might already have hinge cuts, bedding areas. Now they need to stay out of them. Um, and they're just changing their access. So there's a lot of things depending on the client and depending on the landowner that they can do right now to change things drastically for this coming hunting season. And that's the fun part. So then I get the feedback. You know, it's, that's what you were talking earlier. Sometimes it takes an hour and a half, two hours to answer people on YouTube because I want to hear this. I love people saying, you know, this is what happened last year and this is what helped me. Because it's it, if it wasn't helping somebody, if I wasn't getting a lot of feedback on that, then why bother? Yeah. yeah. So and this is fun. It's not, you know, and I tell people, I'm already here. You've already paid me most of the time. You know, by the time I get there, um, now it's time. I want to get results. I want to hear back from you. I want to hear good stories from you. <laughs> That's so, awesome. So it's a fun it right process. Now, Mark. You what can. Now? You can do it right we now. We can do you it can. right now. Even when it's snowing out, what would you do? With hinge cutting. Hinge. So cutting's great right now. I mean, it might be. So in hinge cutting is. Maybe, yeah, maybe walk a person through what that is in that process no, hinge and, cutting, and what it's accomplishing. Yeah, hinge cutting is, that's really, really important because hinge cutting I see can be used on about 20, 25% of all lands. And for one, I like to see those trees in that six, seven inch diameter range and, and lower. Um, typically, you're not hinge cutting, you're not hinge cutting aspen. Uh, basswood is a great one to hinge cut. Uh, maple's great to hinge cut. Shagbark hickory is pretty good to hinge cut. 
And what you're doing is you're creating a hinge, and I like to stay at waist level, belly level. I go to these bedding canopies that have been made where deer actually, basically you're trying to imagine them living under that. Well, bucks aren't trying to hide from birds and planes. They hide from each other. They hide from hunters, which means you have to have side cover. So if you're making this hinge cut bedding area that's really high, head high, or, or, or greater for us, on a knoll somewhere, well, in theory, a deer could, they might use it during the summertime. You might even put a camera there, and they're using it for shade then, and, and they're just trying to stay cool or good airflow. But when it comes to fall and those leaves are down, now that, that deer is sitting on that knoll, and they can see still 200 yards in every direction. So while I'm hinge cutting, I might take an area that's flat like that where I want a deer to bed or an inside bench around here. I'm taking that hinge, and you're cutting it from the backside. There's a hinge cutting tool. It looks like a big hook on a, on a straight stick. It's steel, pretty stiff. And you have someone lean on it and get some leverage. Now you, you only have to cut through that tree, let's say a six-inch diameter tree. You're cutting through it two inches, and you can push it over. Hmm. When you push it over, that outer cambium layer is still attached, and then you get side sprouting. So imagine here's a flat that has several flat areas it's it's a bench let's say it's 40 yards long by 20 yards you might create eight or ten openings in that and then you're hinge cutting around it so that it's not interfering with the movement to the openings i call it a maze and pocket you're not putting anything overhead over a trail over a an opening so now you have not only that hinge that creates side cover to the side you're starting at waist high so deer can't see you you can't see them they can't see other deer they like they get stressed out by other deer too but now the food from the side sprouting on that tree takes place to have ha, takes place at head level for the deer. So now they have that browse they can eat, that daytime browse that they require in their bedding areas, and you've accomplished that with hinge cutting. Now some properties don't have that smaller tree. Let's say it's just all mature trees. I might go into there and I might say, well, this five-acre area should be a bedding area, and you're taking down one undesirable mature tree Every 30 to 40 yards, you're dropping in an opening. You're cherry picking, meaning you're just cutting down the easiest ones that are the safest to cut, and you're dropping those. And now every 30, 40 yards, you have that log and top in there. You're removing about 20, 30% of the canopy. You're getting more regeneration from the fourth floor, more briars, more weeds. And so you take that five-acre area, and you haven't hinge cut. You're just dropping the trees, and it might be a leaning oak. It might be a giant um, old silver maple or maple, soft maple that you're not going to harvest. Um, could be an occasional... Um, giant popple tree, you're just cutting that dr- down and then you're getting that. And then with all those cuttings, you're really looking to the south and the southern hemisphere and making sure you're getting that sunlight into that area because if you're not getting sun and it's shaded, then you're not going to get that growth you want mm-hmm. um, or grow any growth at all. You have other areas where it's you have hingeable trees and then you have mature trees mixed, mixed age. So then you're going into that, you're dropping some of those mature trees just like I'm talking there. And then you might hinge occasionally tree, some of those trees occasionally the last step to those tops and logs so that you're putting more food and side cover on the ground to the deer that might live within that area. So there's a lot of different ways to improve a hardwood lot, and hinge cutting is one of them. But it all boils back down to getting side cover, creating side cover, creating daytime browse, and you have to do it so that deer can actually move through it. And if you're doing this in... Northern Wisconsin, northern Minnesota, um, you know, UP, Michigan, upstate New York, Pennsylvania hardwoods, big Kentucky hardwoods. Deer are used to a lot of space. And so you'd want to make it, you consider that to where if a deer is bedding here, they want to be able to still see 30, 40, 50 yards. Hmm. Now, if it's northern Ohio and you have a 20 acre woodlot, you can put a buck in the back of your pickup bed. I mean, that's how small he doesn't have to see more than five or 10 feet because you're used to compartmentalizing and sticking. 30 deer on a 20 acre parcel where if you try to do that same feature in the north or in a big wood setting down south they uh even some of the southeast georgia area alabama where you have that big those big thick areas if you try to confine those deer they're just they're gonna i've seen completely avoid a five acre clear cut or it's just too thick hmm. so we've had landowners have had loggers come in and foresters we've actually had a dozer go in there then and then clean it up after the logger so the deer can actually use that that cutting and, and yeah. be able to move through that area. So they, they have to move through, you know, thinking again about that balance of mm-hmm. big balance up north, little balance, or big woods, wilderness, and then, uh, you know, little tight areas yeah. in, in small woodlots. It's crazy stuff, man. It's awesome stuff. Wow. I did want to, I know, we, I think, are we going a little bit long here, Jim? Oh, well, we, we MC Ryan flashed the uh, the one-hour <laughs> symbol just a smidge ago, but why don't you 
Go for it. Well, I was just going to say, we talked about... Further further fill our brains. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'm asking Jeff to do that. So <laughs> um, we've talked a lot about food and cover, and we touched on water, but I, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about the importance of water um, and how a person can either utilize what's existing on their property or enhance that or maybe, you know, put something in that, you know, never was there. I love water. And so we've put, been putting out water holes since the, I think the early 2000s. We, f- we started out with half-cut 55-gallon plastic drums and then put them in the ground. We quickly learned that we had to fill them once a week, you know, living seven hours away, mm-hmm. or they just go dry. And once it's dry, that it, it destroys the pattern of use to that. So then the deer, even when you put water back in, it takes a week or two for them to get used to the, yeah, there's water back in You want in a more continuous... Yeah, at least 100 gallons. Okay. And so we looked at, we have some that are 70, um, but most of them are 110. We get them from TSC, you know, local, wherever, and it's either 75 bucks. But I wanted, you know, something really, you know, to set the stage for that water. And the water topic is, if when I'm looking for property and... I'd like to buy some property soon. I've owned property before up in the UP of Michigan, lower Michigan. It wouldn't be a bad thing, and I might even look for property that does not have water. Okay, sure. So the reason for that is deer do not need to drink water. They can get their moisture requirement met by green vegetation. So what we see, yeah, they can go two weeks, three weeks, whatever. It doesn't really matter. Now, during the wintertime, they get dry because they don't have the green vegetation. So I notice a lot of our water holes are pounded on right now. They're trying to get water. Really? But obviously, they're living. You know, even though everything's, they're not going three miles out of the way to hit water and then come back. Do they eat snow? I don't know if they do. That's a great question. (laughs) I was was thinking thinking that. that. (laughs) So, But they eat a lot of, so they get their moisture requirements met from vegetation <laughs> yeah i've been thirsty the whole time <laughs> but uh but yeah the um they uh they're they're hitting that water and so we have trail cameras that we've had on a water hole and let's say it's august september october and we'll go back there and in, let's say it's five weeks and we have a thousand pictures on there we've had cameras that there might be a hundred pictures of deer hitting that water in the morning and 900 at night well, think about if they're sitting dry all day in their bedding areas and they're eating shrub tips, acorns, woody bow- browse, woody regeneration, mm-hmm. even some ragweed goldenrod. The first thing they want to do on a hot day is hit water on the way to food. Once they feed on green vegetation all night, they don't need to hit water on the way back to their beds in the morning. Mm. So the really cool thing on a water hole, and I would not just mention I would never put a water hole unless you can shoot two with a bow, bow hunting, you know, with a bow stand. Um, but that being said, you can always tell when the rut is starting because we're all, right around October 20th, mm-hmm. October 18th, all of a sudden there's buck pitchers at 9 a.m., 11 a.m., 1 a.m., and they're starting to move and cruise, and so that's when they need water too. And so water, I like to use water to reinforce the patterns of movement from bedding to food source. Now, it might be that you're complementing a daytime cruising bench that parallels a a field edge 75 yards in, and that also in that location, so you get daytime cruising at the top of a hollow or something around here on the edge of a woodlot 75 yards in, or you're getting the same movement that forms an X from bedding area across that cruising movement over to food over here. So then you're actually creating an X in movement that you can put a water hole on they're already going to the food plot. They're already going to the bedding area. So I don't like putting water at bedding or food because you already have those attractions. They're already moving. By putting that water in the middle, maybe even a mock scrape, now you have those pieces, kind of like little pieces of glue to hold that movement together. And that's how I love using water. So you're looking at dry bedding areas. And as long as they're bedded dry, it doesn't matter if you have a lake 100 yards behind that or a swamp on your neighbors. Mm-hmm. You're putting that water hole to define that movement from... Daytime dry bedding, the afternoon green food source, and then also taking into account where those bucks might cruise during the day and where they feel safe. Yep. And so whether you're putting 110 gra- gallon water, like this year, and I'll say unfortunately because of Coon Valley, we lost several homes um, due to flooding, but we didn't have to fill our water holes this year. And so that was kind of nice. I've had to fill them up to five times in a dry summer on 100 100 gallon tanks and that's when i was going to the car wash spending 26 (laughs) dollars in a roll of duct tape to keep the handle down so i didn't have to hold it the whole time (laughs) putting 150 gallons in a plastic you know a caged aluminum tank and then i could only fill 
five water holes at a time with not enough water. And so then I'm doing it every, every time I come down and living seven hours away at that right. point. And, um, and so, but by not letting those run out, then they can become an incredible hot spot during the rut. You find water holes that aren't hit during the early season because it's not that part of that pattern of those bucks either moving or those bucks moving from that particular bedding area to food source. The does are closer. A lot of times, if you look at it, those want to be right next to that food source. Right. So that water hole is actually behind them. Does that make sense? So it's like a lot of times the staging area is right before that food source. Bucks are bedding around that area. They're only 50 yards in, 75 yards in. If you try to walk into that spot, you spook the deer. And then you have that bedding area that's 150 to 200 to even 300 yards in, like across the hollow for a buck. You're coming in between that movement. So you're coming in behind the staging area. So you can actually get in there at 3 o'clock in the afternoon for a 630 darkness. Or you can get in there in the afternoon or morning. But you're not coming into that food source staging area. You're not coming into that bedding area. You're just hunting that, you know, basically that barbell in between. Yeah, and you're not, the walking, water hole. you're not walking through either of those things on the way out either. Oh, it's awesome. And, and around yeah. here, you put that water hole in that lip where it's just starting to come down. So now in the morning, you can actually blow your scent right over the water hole because it's blowing elevation to you, and it's just blowing out over the hollow. And then you can also hunt that movement or that wind that's blowing in your face from the water hole. And then the evening, you can hunt that with the wind in your face from the water hole. So you get lots of wow. use uh, using the ridge systems mm-hmm. around here and the thermals um, and being able to hunt deer that are below you in the morning where your scent is blowing right out of the water hole. So water hole can be that glue that holds everything together. <laughs> And, uh, and you just need nothing more. So I go into people with a one acre pond, you know, and they put all those resources into that. I'd rather see that into, you know, taking care of the wood lots, uh, maybe bulldozing out trails around the property, uh, food plot locations and the water holes. I've seen a lot of good ones that are built where they're 20 by 20, 10 by 10. They're dug in with an excavator, uh, bulldozer, uh, some need a liner of some type. But those muddy water holes can be really nice, too. Mm-hmm. Easy in and out for deer to get in and out. You don't want them. Deer really have an aversion if they're down eight feet in a hole. So right. oh, you yeah. really want these to be very shallow so they can still see around. They don't want to get into this pit. They don't like that at all. And even oh, if we're putting in. Likes that. that just sounds yeah. scary to me right now. <laughs> yeah, it literally exactly. sounds like a good practice for any <laughs> mammal. <laughs> and then the, uh, the small tanks, I'm actually, those tanks, if it's 110 gallon, it's about... Uh, 30 inches high by three feet by four feet. And we're actually taking a shovel and digging that down to the lip. So it's actually below mm-hmm. ground level. So it catches water. We're putting it into the side of a hill. It really looks natural. I like black actually, because it just seems like it blends in. I've even noticed deer that have, that don't seem to like it when it's very clear and they mm-hmm. see their reflection. They see the reflection of the sky. It seems just, I would think it would be odd to them. Yeah. But so we throw, you know, a few inches of soil in the bottom, mm-hmm. keep mm-hmm. it stirred up here and there. Um, we rake out the debris in the spring out of those and, and then sometimes fill it with that same tank. Mm-hmm. But other than that, we just let rainwater do its thing. If there's bugs, mosquitoes, I'm planting usually uh, clover around that or um, perennial rye. In a ryegrass, like a Wisconsin roadside mix, mm-hmm. is good, you know, at the local uh, hardware stores or wherever, uh, feed mills. And then that way you don't have that muddy exposure that's getting wet and cracked that actually attracts EHD. And you don't have that midge that can live in there because it's all shaded out with the vegetation around the water hole. So some are water oh, holes okay. in the summer, it looks like a pile of growth right over. You can't even tell there's a water hole there to the one of our landowners uh, daughter was driving a side by side, and we have a video of her driving right into the her <laughs> corner of the side by side, right into one of our water holes, and, and then backing out. And we we heard the the nice uh, nice language on there when she was backing out. We, we <laughs> thought about putting that on one of our videos, oh, but uh, it, I didn't ask him first. But Please it was it do. was pretty yeah it was pretty funny. But yeah, no, they just blend in then, and that's, that's awesome. ultimately what you want. Yeah. And you're still keeping the cover around it. Put a bow put a bow stand nearby, and oh. Yeah, a lot of fun. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so that's some of our best. If you look out the YouTube videos, we have trail cameras on mock scrapes and water holes and sometimes the two of them together. And we get B-roll, daylight photos of box and video. We put it on almost every video. So they're, mm-hmm. they, you know, they're coming in and they're hitting that water hole during the daylight mock scrapes, but it's because everything's natural. And again, it goes back to none of it's hunter pressured. That was, you know... The biggest thing that I took away from, you know, reading your stuff over the years, I mean, I think it was 2014, I was hunting a spot that was the the most undesi- undesirable place for deer. It was 34 acres of nothing but mature planted white pines, like literally planted in a row, 
you know, probably 30, 40 years ago. So it's nothing but the same habitat, monotonous nonsense. And we put in one of those kiddie pools after watching one of your, your videos. And that year, um, shot two nice bucks off that place. And then the following year shot a, another mature deer off that property. Before that, we'd never shot anything like of any, you know, so like a couple does, a couple small bucks, but nothing to really like write home about. So it's, well, that's, that's kind of like a, a high quality mock scrape can really define movement in a certain area that I think bucks will go out of the way, their way, 30, 40, 50 yards. Same with the water hole. Um, and if you add that food plot on the end and your, your bedding area is here and then around here we get the advantage of we're hunting on a bench or whatever. But what's interesting about a water hole there, you probably noticed that, it, and this is what happens too, it's not just for that stand location. Mm-hmm. It's actually reinforce, reinforcing and assisting the stand location that's 100 yards this way mm-hmm. and one that's 100, yard that, 100 yards that way because they're in, all in that same line of movement. And that's, again, going back to that's why I don't like putting the water in food plots mm-hmm. or putting it in that bedding area because mm-hmm. those are already attractants. So you're trying to put those pieces together, the longer you can make that movement, then you often have, you know, stand location behind the bedding area, mm-hmm. stand location of the food source, stand location of the water hole, mock scrape. And so you're getting three to four stands out of that movement. And they're all have a specific purpose of evening towards the water hole or towards the food plot. And then uh, morning by the water hole or back by the bedding area. And so you have an as- assemblage that makes sense. And, and when you start putting those pieces in, then you can see, I mean, a water hole, I mean, it, it probably enhanced other stands. Mm-hmm. It reinforced the movement. And, and again, you're going back to if that was public land, it might be that you're looking at a funnel out in the swamp that connects to a big conifer stand that's low. And that connects to a tag alder, which goes into a cedar swamp, which goes into a finger ridge off a of hardwood, stand of hardwoods, and then the elevation changes. And you know that guys are in there and hunters and they're putting bait out in those hardwoods. And then you're hunting that buck three quarters of a mile back as he's going through those pieces back to his bedding area. And it's no different, you know, that might be a mile and a quarter long, but it's no different than that 275 yard movement that you create on a 40 acre parcel. Hmm. You're just putting the pieces together. They move bigger up there in the, you know, big woods where they have more space anyways. So you're just thinking bigger, bigger property and fewer deer. They're used to space. And then you're just applying that same concept to a 40, 60, 100 acre, 20 acre piece, whatever yeah. it is. So. That's awesome. That's wild cool. stuff. What do you say we go into the last calls here? Yep. On that note. So I like it. I like it. That's <laughs> you going to start? Well, I was going to. So, With Jeff. One of your seven, I'm sure, that are probably. To I come. think I only have one. Really? One to seven. Okay. Uh, Jeff, we go and generally do a last call, wrap up, final thought. You want me to go? Well, yeah, you're going right now. All right, I'm going. So, uh, <laughs> my I'm still trying to process everything. Oh, that's my internal say. brain's file cabinet is like overflowing. I need to go on Amazon Prime and you know buy another one real quick to put in my head. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing you have the Prime account. Yeah. <laughs> no, man, Jim. I mean, exactly. We've talked about a lot. We talked about public land, private land, habitat management, how you can apply you know knowledge of habitat and the deer's needs to private. Or to public land, psychology um, of a deer almost to a level that makes me wonder if you are part deer. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> all those things. But one thing, you know, has been pretty consistent, and it's in its its habitat and what does a deer need to live and what's optimal for that. And one thing that I think stood out to me is we've been pretty like hyper focused about talking about deer, but when you said all these things, when these um, you know the diversity of habitats and everything converges you're seeing all these different types of wildlife. You're seeing the rabbits, you're seeing the grouse, you're seeing. And so even though maybe a person's primary focus is like, oh, I want to improve deer habitat, you're not just improving deer habitat, you're improving the habitat as a whole and a variety of species are benefiting. So I just think that's really cool. If you put a bullseye on the wall and you put whitetail in the middle and all the wildlife around it, that is truly, if you're hitting whitetail and you're meeting the needs of whitetail with the diversity and variety and edge that they truly need, then you're encompassing a huge amount of wildlife species. I, I think the most. So if you're rabbit low cover, I've been I've I've run field trials and and, uh, and you have the low pallets and stuff. There's no deer there, and uh, but you have rabbits. And then if you have the grasses mixed in, briars, diversity out into upland cover, you have pheasants. And then if you have the hardwood regeneration, different ages of aspen regeneration and stand, you might have grouse. And so you you really do complement a lot of wildlife. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately. 
And I had an apology on my videos I put out the other day where just I talk about buck management all the time. And again, that's the right. lowest hole. That's the hunting pressure, lowest hole, but it does encompass a lot of other wildlife species mm-hmm. that are that are very important too. Yeah. Rick? I guess for me it would just be that, you know, a lot of this stuff, like everyone wants to have better hunting opportunities. Like I don't think anyone would say that they'd want worse. So if that's you, like you can do a lot of this stuff with just, you know, a day of hard work, buy a $15 or, or whatever it costs to put a kiddie pool in the ground, fill yeah. it with water and some soil, yeah. or, you know, fire up the chainsaw and get cut and some Play with stuff. some mock scrapes. Yeah, there's a yeah. lot you can do to improve your hunting without breaking the bank, which I think is pretty neat. Very nice. All right. Over to you. Jeff, well, cool. what do you think? I think, uh, you know, one of the things, if you look back, anything you're doing on your land for habitat, if you relate it back to, you know, if I was a deer, do I want this? Does this make sense that, you know, does typically um, bed closer to food, bucks behind them, and you have to have those layers built in. The food is very important. You want your food to be the bottom of that daylight movement. You really can, on 20, 30, 40 acres, set up a foundation of movement that is typical in the whitetail woods, privately and public, doesn't really matter, that then gives you that access, gives you that stand location assemblage so that you can make actually make sense of a small parcel. You know, it's, it's a little bit backwards from the way where this is a great wetland area, we'll just put a pond there. Uh, this is a great place for food plot because it's open field and, you know, grab a soil map and choose your uh, best soil on the property, put a food plot there. You know, those are many years ago. This is more putting this in the way deer would typically move, mature box towards the back, those towards the front, towards the food source, have that bottom of funnel of daylight movement, keep it whole, keep it consistent, and you really can create a foundation that uh, you can hunt from, plan from. And what's cool is if you shoot a, shoot a mature buck out of that movement, then typically you've patterned them really well, and when another mature buck slots into that two years later, you have them. And so your sits become very methodical. You're just watching the weather, making sure that you're choosing the right stand based on that morning, based on that weather, but it's all fit in within that foundation of movement. So getting that foundation together is critical, and, um, and, and that boils back to how they actually naturally move, how they want to relate to each other, and how bucks relate to does and yeah, in their daily food sources. Yeah. All right. For my last call, I think that was an excellent one. For my last call, I'm going to say one. Mark's going to love this one. Look at, I'm all ears. look at his face right now. I I we went into this one, so we just recorded a podcast not not long ago. And as far as at the time of this recording, about you know the big buck craze and things like that. Mm-hmm. And I remember at the time st- thinking like, oh, that's you know that's weird. I don't know how how big I am into the whole big buck craze or mm-hmm. whatever. Like to me, it's just a deer's a deer or whatever. Mm-hmm. And and. Then talking about this stuff, I remember prior to this podcast, you know, telling Mark, I was like, this stuff about people like manipulating their land to like be better for you, this is weird, man. And now actually hearing about how all this goes together and and the amount of understanding of deer, how they work, how they function, how they like to move about the habitat and, and, you know, how risk averse they are and how you can, I mean, just all these things. It really shows that doing something like this takes an incredible amount of work. And it also helps you understand deer, whether you're hunting private or public or just anywhere. Mm -hmm. And that, I'd imagine that if anybody got into doing this, whether it was their land or, again, we've talked about it, whether you lease a spot or you have permission on a spot or even if you are on public and you can just look for things like this, the more that you can try to get into a deer's head, the more you'll ultimately end up understanding it and just becoming oh, a better hunter. And so, yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's pretty cool. And so that was the part that was... I think I we was, got. I think we got him turned, Eric. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'll ever fully admit what? it to your face. I don't know if I'll say those words. I'm turned because I can just look at your cheesy can, grin right I now. I can see it in your eyes. <laughs> anyway, well, that's mine. I think. I think it is pretty sweet, and we've definitely got. We've definitely got like if the CIA is in need of operatives or anything like that to just really. We have two candidates. We in have the two room. candidates. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe both of which are already potentially yeah. the CIA. Who knows? <laughs> um, but yeah, what do you say? I think that'll do it. 
Jeff, thanks again for joining us. This yeah, thanks been, a lot for this. This has been fun. a super cool podcast. I think a lot of people are going to enjoy this one. And if you have uh, any questions, it sounds like they can find you on social media. Yeah, right? they, they can look up the YouTube channels. It's White Tail Habitat Solutions, but if they put my name in there too, Jeff Sturgis, you can usually find it pretty easy too. So, Perfect, perfect. So with that said, we're going to head out. A little blizzardy action right now in uh, southwestern Wisconsin. So I'm sure uh, Jeff and your wife got to try and travel home safe, and so um, do we. She already saw a place she wants to eat on the way home, so we're Perfect. we're going Perfect. <laughs> hey, to a low. We'll, we'll stop blizzard, and relax. In a blizzard, if you got a place to eat, I think you're you're in good shape. Yeah, you know? we're all set. We're all set. <laughs> we have full gas in the tank, so we're we're good. Awesome. awesome. Well, thanks again, and uh, to everybody listening out there, happy hunting and shooting out there. We'll see you next time. All right, that'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation podcast. Again, everybody, thanks, and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.